when I was putting this together, the first thing that came to my mind is Philippians 4, 19, where he says, and uh, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches um, in Christ Jesus. And so everything that we need um, for this season and thereafter, God has already provided for us. And so one of the things with financial wellness is learning the tools that we need to help prepare us for how to access those things that God has already promised for us to have. And so um, the first um, habits that I want to talk about today is to create a noodle budget. Um, when I think of noodle budget, I'm thinking of that time when we were like eating ramen noodles, you know, in my college life, I had some good old ramen noodles and I learned multiple ways of cooking them from adding in some good peas in there to carrots to at one point, I remember putting Cheetos in there. You got to do what you got to do when you are on a budget. And so we want to sort of go back to that time where we had a budget that, was, that only consisted of our necessities. Because we are in a pre-recession, so we don't want to be in a season that we're wasting, especially when we don't know what gonna, tomorrow's going to look like. So when you're creating a noodle budget, you want to ensure that your budget has your income and that's how much money you're bringing in, no matter what that is, whether it's your unemployment, whether it's child support, whether it is um, from your job, all the income that you bring in, you want to make sure you have a column that says income and you write that down. The next thing you want in your budget is your bills and your expenses. So how much money do you put out? What all is being spent? What, what's those expectations? Credit cards, lights, gas, mortgage, rent, all that's got to go on that budget um, sheet. And so you want to lay that out very clearly. And the next thing you want to include is your interest rates. You want to ensure that you're looking at your credit card statements. And again, you can write this budget down on a sheet of paper. You can put it in an Excel spreadsheet, whatever it takes. You just want to make sure you're writing it down. And um, on that, you have your interest rates in a column and you make sure you say Visa credit card, 20% interest. You want to know those interest rates, whether it's your student loan, your mortgage, uh, regular loan, whatever it is, you want to highlight that. And that's very important because once you lay out the interest rates, you then want to go and research what those interest rates are generally. And so we have seen that interest rates have been falling, especially when it comes down to mortgages and personal loans. And so if you find in your research that, oh, wow, these credit cards are at 20% and my credit card rate is at 27%. That's a good time to contact that credit card company. Right now, they're busy um, with calls, but you can call them or email them and say, hey, um, I've been a customer of yours for quite a bit of time. Um, and this is providing you're in good payment status, of course. And you say, um, is there any way you can lower my interest rate? I was comparing other interest rates with other offers I've received and they are at 20%. I currently have a 27% interest rate. Can you match that? Um, they may say no, say, hey, can I speak to a manager or continue to email them, but don't give up on that because this is a good season for getting some interest rates reductions, which will save you a lot of money later. The same thing for, um, a mortgage, you know, if you're in a mortgage and your interest rate is at 6% and you can refinance that thing right now at a 3%, then do that. So make sure you're knowing what the current interest rates are because you want to know what your interest rates is and you want to know what the current interest rates that's happening with our economy right now are and then take advantage of those. Um, again, you want to make sure you just know where your money is going at all times. You don't want to leave anything up for any surprises for you and your money. The next thing you want to make sure that you're doing is to get rid of the I deserve speech or um, what I like to call it mentality. Um, it often ties itself to a reward that will cost you in ways that you're not seeing in the moment. Um, I was listening to Dave Ramsey today and he says, to everybody, don't panic. No one makes good decisions when they are panicked or when they're panicking. And so that kind of ties into the um, I deserve mentality. Um, I always say that the I deserve mentality is the most damaging to 
all of our personal finances. It is so damaging. And one of the reasons that is, is because let's say, for example, you decide I deserve a new car. And so you go and you shop for that new car. That new car will not only gobble up your expenses for something else that you could be spending that money in, but it's going to take away from um, whatever purposes that you've placed for yourself, whatever goals that you're trying to establish, whether it's a retirement fund, whether it is um, paying off some other debt, getting your house paid for, because you have to have interest rate if you don't have the cash to pay it for it out front. Or you have to get car insurance, which is generally higher if you have a new car as opposed to a new car. So in that sense, deserve, saying I deserve something, it becomes a reason to indulge. And the pastor talked about this on Sunday when he talked about gluttony. Um, it's basically sort of like this form of, of greed. It's where we're never content. And so it, o it generally overlooks completely the rewards and benefits that you've already received from what you've achieved to date. Um, believing that you deserve something, it's more than what you already have. It implies that you've taken for granted the things that God has already blessed you with. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't have goals, you know, wow, I would love to have a house, I would love to have um, a nicer car. Those things, there's nothing wrong with, with wanting that, but when we say I deserve, um, that's where it gets really dangerous. And so the truth is most of us are already rewarded beyond our wildest dreams. We've already had those things that um, that truly matters that God wants for us in our lives. Um, the average American lives in a perpetual state of pleasure, um, constantly looking for that sort of affluence that I think even King Solomon would have been jealous of in this season that we're in now. Um, we have homes, we have devices, I mean, a lot of the newer cell phones and just this modern technology that never existed um, back when my great grandmother, who was 104 now, even had. And so we tend to spend our money on our own leisure, of our own choosing. And so we do have a lot more freedoms, but it's not that we deserve it. It's just something that God has been blessing us with. And there is a difference. Um, I think that when we say I deserve, it takes away the it takes the focus away from the abundance that we have, and and it goes into the scarcity mindset. Um, I found this quote that was by I read this book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and in there. Um, he said something very insightful. He says, and I want to read it. He says, most people are deeply scripted in what I call the scarcity mentality. They see life as having only as much as though there were only one pie out there. And so the scarcity mentality, it's sort of the zero sum paradigm of life, right? Um, it's believing that you deserve something for your efforts just because. It's deeply ingrained in the scarcity mindset because I have this piece of pie, but I feel like just this slice of pie is not sufficient. I want the whole pie. It's not good enough just to have this slice. Um, and again, that goes back to what the pastor talked about on Sunday. You don't really need to have a bigger slice um, of that pie. And so it inherently um, keeps you from being happy. Um, I want to go over a couple of scriptures that I think kind of falls in line with the I deserve mentality. Um, Luke 12 and 15. Luke 12 and 15 says, um, and I'm going to read it from the, the NIV version. It says, then he said to them, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Um, you don't need five cars. You don't need three cars. One car is sufficient. You don't need to win a car, some car. You're good with the one car, okay? That you don't need 20 dresses. It's okay. You know, put a belt on it one day and it looks new. It's fine. Um, but oftentimes we want what we think we deserve, but we already have an abundance of a lot of things. And in this season, we really want to make sure that we're scaling back. Um, John 2 and 16, I'm going to read that one from the, the New Living Trend, uh, Translation Bible. You know, King James is great. I love him. He's great. It's a great Bible. But sometimes you got to really get into some different um, translations. And so this one says, 1 John 2 and 16, it says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. 
Have you ever met those people and they're like, oh, check out my new Mercedes, check out my new car. And sometimes it's like, you know, wow, look at you, you've really worked hard. But other times it's those people who are really prideful in those possessions. You want to make sure you know that difference when you're out here getting the things that God is blessing you with versus the things that you've convinced yourself that you deserve to have. And then in Hebrews 13 and 5, the um, New International Version, it says, um, keep your lives free. And I'm going to tell you what's, what's um, in fact, I want to read this out of the King James Version. I'm going to actually pull it up. Do I want to read it? From, yes, I do want to read it from the King James Version because I want to, um, what I want to do is I want to compare Hebrews 13, 13 and 5, just because it's actually one of my, in my prayer room, I actually have this um, have the scripture up. Um, the NIV version says to keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, "Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you." Um, and the reason why I wanted to read that one and compare it to the King James is because I actually have them both in my prayer room. If it lets me pull it up, it's not looking like it's loving me today. I have an electronic Bible that actually has all the versions. No, that is not gluttony. <laughs> so I just like all the versions, but if you might pull it up for me, who has it? Which one? What version? King Hebrews 13 and 5, King James. Oh, here it is. Hey guys, my little. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Um, so one of the reasons why I wanted both to be read is because one talks about conversations and the other one says lives free. And um, to me, both of those is equally important. It means watch what you're saying, how you're saying it, but you also want to live it. So you want to make sure that what you're saying and the way that you're living lines up with each other. Um, and so that's why both of those happens to be up on my sticky note in the prayer room, because I want to make sure that my life and what I, the way I live and the way I converse matches up with God's word. The third habit is you want to make sure that you change your spending habits. I mean, you really only want to buy what you need. Um, if you budgeted $200 for groceries for the month, um, and there isn't an emergent need for groceries, meaning you don't have an empty pantry, there is food, um, then don't buy them because you simply can't afford it. You can't afford to go over that budget, not, not in this season. Um, like I said, you want to discontinue any unnecessary spending. Look at what your essential bills are. And that's like the light, the water, um, it's really going to be the roof over your head. Look at those essential bills, and that's what you want to continue to pay. You may have to tell the company, the cable company, I don't got it. So if here comes you know, Comcast saying, I need that $120. Look, Comcast, I don't got it. Yeah. You can take that time to negotiate um, a lower bill, right? Hey, Comcast, I, I was looking online. I saw you had a special for $60, and right now I'm paying hundred. Is there any way I can get in on that deal? They may say no. And you may have to be willing to risk it all and walk away, but that's okay because you can only do what you can do. If you can't afford it, I'm not telling you to avoid the debt collectors because that's an integrity issue. You don't want to avoid the, the debt collectors. If you owe the people money, call them and just say, I don't got it. But you want to ensure that if that you let go of the bills that you just simply don't need, especially in this season. You don't need that unlimited phone plan with Verizon right now. You might need to go down to the to the cheaper plan because you simply cannot afford that. And so that's something that you want to make sure that you're doing. Get into the I don't got it mindset because it was it will change your life, especially in this season and next season. Okay. Um, if there isn't a line item in your budget, you can't afford it. And I just tell people all the time, can't afford it, don't got it, can't afford it, don't got it. Those are your two new words that you want to make sure that you adapt into your mindset in this season. Again, know where that money is going. Habit number four, and that is do not waste anything. Um, so I'm not a person to waste. I'm the person that would take my bread and slap it in the freezer because I don't want to waste bread. Um, I'll tell you a tip. This is a very old 
old tip. Like I said, my great grandmother is 104. And so I'm sure she's lived through a whole bunch of seasons, right? A whole bunch of stuff happening and she's still around. And we were kids, she would tell us the bread will start to get a little moldy. And she'd say, don't throw that bread away. Don't waste money. She would tell us to put a celery stick inside of the bread and to put the bread in the refrigerator for a couple of days. And I kid you not, you take that bread out of the refrigerator after a couple of days and the mold is gone. And you can eat it. I'm telling y'all, no, change lives. It change lives. So I don't waste breads. I still do this to this day. Me and that bread, we're going through. We're we're making it. So you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, I can give you guys some other tips. For example, um, milk. Milk is a really great um thing that I tell people is don't waste your money um buying milk if you know your family's gonna drink one glass and you got a whole gallon. Don't, don't do it to yourself because though milk may be looking like it's for a good deal, it's a dollar and some change and you're like, this is a good price. You don't want to waste. You cannot afford to waste your food. Freeze what you don't use. Look at the organic milk section because sometimes it has a longer shelf life, so it may cost a little bit more, but it does have, in fact, have a, um, a long shelf life. I can tell you guys another tip that I actually wrote down listening to great grandma in her times. Um, I remember that, you know, when you buy strawberries, it gets a little moldy in the refrigerator and you just be like, oh, goodbye. My great grandmother would not allow us to throw away them strawberries. We would have to put it in like an, um, an eighth cup of water with apple cider vinegar mixture. And you throw the strawberries inside of there and you leave them in there for about, well, about five minutes, take them out, put them back in the container, put them in the refrigerator, wait a couple of days, the mold is gone and it's like fresh new strawberries. Kid you not, I'm telling you. This is just stuff that we used to do during this time. And I'll tell you because we're looking at um, a, a financial problem in the future, especially with the, when the recession hits after all this is over. Um, some of these tips, um, I had, like I said, I had family, grandmother, grandparents who lived during the Great Depression. Some of these tips was what they had to do simply because strawberries could have been a hot commodity back then. And so unless you got a garden um, with, the, with the free flow, you might want to just kind of figure out ways that you can actually save. And again, like I said, freeze what you don't need because you can unthaw it and you can eat it. You can warm it up and eat it again. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys something else that you can do with milk because you know, um, milk is where it's at. Now, if you do buy the almond milk, it lasts a really good time. You could keep it on the shelf. You don't have to put it in the refrigerator. But let's say your milk starts getting a little bit clumpy because it's that old. You put a little spoon of salt in the milk, shake it up real good, sit in the refrigerator for a couple days. Good as new, you can drink it again. Just saying, that salt is a good, a little, good little tip. Um, but the fifth habit, um, things that you can do um, to getting your finances back to help is build some skills. It's really some skill building time right now. I don't think it makes a person, if you spend this time and you wanna relax, um, I don't see anything wrong with that. But I think in this season, um, it's very important that you look at what your current skills is, is at and see how you can sort of garner some money, some extra cash off of it. Um, you wanna make sure that you're staying busy. So what skills do you currently have that you can perfect? Um, the pastor is obviously learning how to be a secretary these days, so he's getting his skills <laughs> perfected. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining today. Yeah, see there? So perfect your skills and, and write your business plan out if you have one. Think about something. Think about what your passions are, because I tell you, the enemy, he's so busy during this season. He wants our passions to be gone. And so you don't want to let those passions go out. Figure out what your passions are and then learn a skill. If you've always wanted to learn Spanish, it's a good time for you to just get that Spanish going. If you wanted to read a real good book, this is a good time to get that book um, read. Um, I believe that we are in a time, a season where God wants us to build. This is a time to build. Um, I think that God is calling for Noah's in this season. Um, he wants someone that is really willing to build despite everything that's going on around us. And so I think that's very, very important. Um, we all know that Noah was sort of a righteous man, right? He walked with God. He did as God said. And so there went the ark. People thought he was crazy. Why is he building this thing? But um, 40 days later, he comes out and they had to repopulate the whole, the whole world. And so let your skill be that thing that it might look crazy now that you're building it, but that skill may end up making you money later. Because at the end of all of this, we want to get back to building wealth. 
They say that um, in retirement, we want to have at least 15 to 20% of our income in retirement. There is a thing that says by 2053, a study said by 2053, um, black wealth will be non-existent. So we will be at 0%. We want to make sure that we are building skills for today because by 2053, I don't know if I'm going to still be here. I don't know. But I know that um, the generations after us, we want to ensure that there is some wealth stored up for them. And so save what you can so that way moving forward from now, 2030, 2053 even from now, there is something left for our people. Sure, that's a very good point that you make there. And um, I think I think the I won't say elaborate on it, but it's very important that they just heard what you just said. Um, and you know, we've talked about this, you and I and different people, that um, somewhere around 1997, it was uh, projected that um, Blacks would be a permanent underclass in America. And since 1960, the Civil Rights Bill was passed, we do not own any more wealth than we did then. We're at less than 1% of the wealth. And why this is so important is because because of the COVID-19 and, and the other things that they're trying to do, they are calling for a massive um, recession and they are not trying to bring the jobs back. And so what you are saying, I think people that, that are sitting here, they don't realize the, what we're on the verge of. They are, they, they are strategically shutting this down to bring it back up in a certain way. And, Again, they're trying to give people kind of like a pacifier. So can mm -hmm. you kind of just give a brief moment, kind of elaborate on that? Because this is going to affect churches. This is going to affect single parents. This is going to affect everything that, that we know, that we now know. And that's why we're having this call. Yeah, so um, several years ago, um, and the pastor's right, so 1997, Decades ago, um, I was coming out of high school, living my best life, I think, at the time. And I don't even think I really realized um, the impact of wealth at that time. If I did, I wouldn't have been out here grabbing every credit card that they had available to me when I was walking down the streets of Michigan Avenue and everywhere else at campus when I was going to Michigan State. Um, but as I began to age and I begin to see the wealth that sort of has left our communities and doesn't look like it's coming back around here. Um, I'm like, oh my goodness. And so I've been watching the, the trends and we really owe it to ourselves to, to, to know better so that we can do better. A lot of this mindset that we have came from the way that we were raised, right? This, I deserve this, I deserve that, I feel like I need this, no one's gonna tell me I can't have this. And I don't want to shame anybody for that because I think that that is something that we have to break free from and we have to be healed from. Um, I had to be healed from it. So I don't think that there's any shame in, in that. I think the devil likes to move in shame. So I don't think there's any shame in that. But I want to encourage everybody to understand that if it is true, if what the trends are saying is true, because we are seeing the numbers are decreasing, if by 2053, your kids and their kids and their kids is sitting around with 0% wealth, what will you have to leave for them? That's why it's such a push in ensuring that you have insurance. You want to make sure you have that, so because that's something that your family could probably continue to have in terms of some income after you're gone. You want to ensure that you don't have unnecessary debt, but most importantly, you want to start really working on that retirement because you don't want to retire and just continue to scrimp and scrimp and scrimp. We have been in a season of struggle. Our people have been in a season of struggle for a long, long, long time. And when the, the jobs moved, when the jobs moved overseas, that's another thing that took away even from our state, from the state of Michigan, the automobile capital, it took a lot of jobs away. It caused a lot of blue collar people to sort of reduce themselves. It took away some even opportunities that we really didn't have anyway, but if we could have, it, it limited some of our opportunities um, to get to that white collar, right? Because a lot of people are kind of coming in with that experience. And so the, the dollar became, how can these companies make more money? Let's send the jobs over to China. Let's send the jobs over here so the companies can make more and it impacted our own communities. 
It impacted the Flint area, which we see um, dealing with problems now. So it impacted them and it impacted communities even in the Detroit area. And so how does these, how does these, what people think, this gentrification and all of these issues that are kind of occurring within our communities, how is it impacting us? It looks good when they're building up these fresh new buildings in these areas, but the impact to our financial wealth is critical to our success as people by 2053. I don't want my wealth to die with me. I want to be able to pass it on from generations to generation to generation. And that's what I'm hoping that we learn in these healthy habits, how to really scale back. When grandma and them said to reuse that fall, girl, rinse that fall off and reuse it. Don't throw it away. Ain't no holes in it. It's still good. That still applies today. I apply it in my house and I'm 40 years old, but I will not be throwing away fall unnecessarily. I do not throw away plastic bags unnecessarily. I like to, I don't, I recycle, but I will reuse until, I can, until it can be recycled. And that's kind of what we really need in this season. We have a question here that, that's been asked and um, uh, I'll let my wife answer it or ask it rather. So the question is, how do I increase my credit score during the pandemic? Um, so I tell people, what, okay, so what's happening now is oh, when there was an emergency savings fund, I used to be like, get an emergency savings fund, you need three to six months. Those people who have it, have it. So they're like, woo. And those people who don't, they're like, oh. Um, and the reason why that's important is because if you have an emergency savings fund, you probably have a pretty decent credit score. So when you need the credit, it's available. So this is kind of where we are now. When you needed the credit, um, when you didn't need the credit, you wasn't getting it because that's what you're not supposed to be doing back then. Now, if you need the credit, you might need to consider it. So this is a good time to build a credit score, but I'll tell you, it's challenging. And the reason why it's challenging is because I'm telling people, when I'm, the people I'm coaching, pay the minimum amount due on your credit card. Don't be out here talking about here's an extra $100. You can't afford that. You don't got it. You don't got it. So it's very hard to, to build your credit score up if you have debt right now, because um, that in order to build it up, that, remain, that means you have to actually pay off some debts. So I say, do the debt snowball effect best that you can. But quite frankly, pay the minimum amount due, save what you can, only pay the essentials. Um, it is a challenge. The best thing that you can do is if there's any current skills that you have that can get you some extra cash, bring in some extra cash. Um, but whatever you do, don't take away from whatever income you currently have and try to throw it at building that debt. All you can do right now is try to maintain a credit score. You don't want it to get lower. So that means don't just run out here not paying nothing. But by getting rid of stuff that you do not need, taking care of those things, those essentials only on that noodle budget, that's going to kind of help maybe free up some money to get the stuff. But just continue to pay on time. If you know somebody with, that trusts you, like, you know, grandma and them that has a good credit score, they can um, put you on as an authorized user on their credit card. Don't, don't spend their credit card. They can put you as an authorized user. If they have good credit and they're paying their bill, you benefit. So you never have to see the credit card ever, but you will benefit because they keep, you know, grandma and them, they paying their bills on time, sister, cousin, friend, whatever, paying their bill on time. And because they're paying their bill on time, your credit score can, we call it jump like Jordan. So your credit score will, will jump just because you're connected to that card. That's probably the easiest way to get that credit card, that credit card, I mean, sorry, that credit score up. In this season and you talk a little bit about um very briefly uh, on the same area you know about the three credit bureaus right because a lot of people don't realize that you're being judged it's like an average attitude you talked about attitudes right and mentalities so mm -hmm. your credit score represents a mentality of the collective group of people in that in that in that kind of range of score so it's not just your score, it's like an average. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because most people don't understand that. Yeah, so there's three different scores, um, Experian, TransUnion, and um, it's another one with an E. Equifax. Equifax. Um, so there's three different scores, um, but you also got a Vanguard score, you've got a FICO score. Um, depending on what creditors um, that you have, they may look at the FICO score. They may not look at, Experian or any of those. 
Um, so you want to know what your credit score is on all, uh, all fronts. Um, Vanguard score, you typically see like for insurance, it's like car insurance, and things like that. But for the most part, um, the FICO score really is the most common score. I do a lot of uh, real estate investments. And I always, when I'm getting ready to invest in a company, I ask for their, I ask for, um, I, I invest as an investor, should I say. And I look at the FICO score over Experian, over the others. Because what you have is you've got an average of the three. And that kind of is what the FICO score is about. So that's what the pastor is talking about. You want to make sure that your, um, that your scores is looking good because um, ultimately, if you have a 700 is pretty decent, a 650, you can, there's some things you can get, but the interest rate is, is kind of jacked up. So don't get so caught up in, um, I need a 700 score today. Quite frankly, if you have a 650 and you're maintaining it, that may be okay, but just continue to pay bills and it will improve. Trust me, you'll get there once we get through this season. But I think the main goal, when you have the three different credit or really four, when you have the four different credit scores is to make sure that you understand that if you need to dispute something on there, it's really looking at them. It's knowing what's on there. Let it go beyond just, oh, this is a 650 here, a 700 there. Really understanding why your score is the way that it is is very important. So if there's debts on there that is seven years old that hasn't fallen off or any of those things, um, I was on a conference call the other day with some other financial people and they said, ooh, now is a good time to dispute all those debts. What you need to do is just write those letters and dispute them because them people ain't in office anyway. Um, and so dispute the debts of, of things that are old, things that you don't really think should be on your credit, send those letters out. I do have examples of letters that you can send to. People can always send me a message and I can get that over to you, but you can um, dispute that debt. That's another way to get your credit score up, but it's also another way um, to ensure that there is an increase, but it does take time to build your credit. But yes, like the pastor said, there are, there's really four different scores because there is the FICO score that exists. And um, I like to look at the FICO score as usually the lowest of all the scores because it is sort of the average of the other three. We got one more question. How do we break into the stock market? market? Um, um, in this season, don't. And this season, don't, don't do it to yourself. Um, what you want to do in this season, if you're financially stable, is to invest in your 401k and your retirement. Um, I cannot express it enough. In fact, in the season we're in, especially in recession and recession time, we're in pre-recession right now, but later on down the line, we're going to be in a full-fledged recession. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. I'm telling y'all, it's just, it's just it is what it is. So um, what you want to do is if you have the extra money, Meaning, and I actually have a percentage. I have a thing that I always write. Meaning you already have a three to six month emergency savings plan. If you don't have that, you don't have any money just to invest right now. Um, you can invest something, but you don't want to get carried away because you can't afford it. Um, if, if you um, haven't paid your house off, don't be donating 15 to 20% in, into your stock markets and stuff. Like, don't do that. Don't, don't put that in retirement. Put a little something in there. Because what I tell people is, Dave Ramsey will teach you, don't put anything into a retirement until you've paid off all your debts and stuff. Don't do that. Because people of color, unfortunately, we kind of come into the world already behind. So if it takes me... 30 years to pay off my student loans, but it takes someone else 20 years or 15 years because they had a little bit of a hand up that I didn't have, then by the time I get my loans paid off, I'm just now being able to get into my retirement and I'm only about 10, 15 years before I can retire. So don't do that. Always put something in there because I'm sorry to be the bad news again. Most people start off in the back. And if you're trying to work your way up in the front, you don't want to work your way in the front from a zero standpoint. Just put something in there. And then once you get a little bit more money, keep on pouring in. The goal is to get to the 20%. That's the goal. Um, but don't, that don't mean that that 1% mean nothing, because it does. Um, he will tell you, pay off your house, then build wealth. Building up wealth when it comes to stock is the last thing you want to do. Because before you put the monies and stuff in that stock, you want to make sure you have retirement, which is a form of investment. You want to make sure you have insurance. People out here trying to get stock with no life insurance, I'm confused. So you want to make sure that you have that. If you don't have life insurance, no stocks yet, not yet. You want to get all those duckies in a row, and then you can get into stocks 
um, into the stock market. And the best way to do that is getting yourself a financial advisor or planner, um, and they will help you. You want to research sort of the different types of funds that exist. Mutual funds are the best, but that's typically 401s. You can find some good old mutual funds. Um, but you want to get into those markets by finding you um, a broker of sorts that has the lowest rates. Because I'll tell you, someone will tell you 1%, and that 1%, you know, looks really good until 10 years from now when you're ready to take that money out and they out here getting a million dollars and you go, whoa. So you want to make sure that you're able to know what that um, percentage is. And that's something that I can help people with too, because I believe that there are people that's ready to advance in that space. But please know that in this season with the market the way that it is, I made the mistake of looking at my... Um, I looked the other day, I will not be looking again until after this season is up because I was almost about to panic. Yeah. So um, you want to make sure that you don't um, succumb yourself to that fear or that pressure because you will be just constantly looking. I just took the apps off my phone. Just don't even do it. It's just not a good time when we're in a recession. Well, listen, Sherry, um, we have enjoyed this session. There's so much more to this. And I really, I really appreciate these habits that you've given 